Uh, my name is Omar Adawajere, and I'm the assistant director at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at NYU. Uh, on behalf of our director, Jill Lane, our faculty and students, uh, we want to welcome you to our second session of the Essential or Expendable series, uh, which is presented in partnership with the Latinx Project, uh, represented uh, by Mireya Loza, uh, uh, who's co-moderating tonight and directed by Arlene Davila. Uh, with the support of NYU's Department of Nutrition and Food Studies, uh, shared by uh, Krishnendur Ray, uh, whom we're honored to have as our moderator tonight. Thank you, Krishnendur. And, and the North American Congress on Latin America, NACLA, and their executive director, Alejandro Velasco. Special thanks also to Johanna Morales from CLAX and our interpreter, Arlene Doss. Uh, uh, we also want to extend our warmest welcome to our guest speakers tonight, uh, Karina Kaufman Gutierrez and Mohamed Atea of the Street Vendor Project. Thanks for being here and for the work that you do. Uh, today, we look forward to an insightful conversation on the role of food vendors uh, who anchor our communities, feed us, and are so emblematic uh, of New York in building the economy within the context of COVID-19 and the uprisings against racial injustice and police brutality. Uh, please make sure to join the conversation by posting your questions on the Q&A box found on the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. And now um, I pass the virtual podium uh, to Mireya Loza, who's assistant professor at uh, the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies and co-organizer of this series. Uh, she's gonna say more about it, uh, tonight's event and informally introduce our guests. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody and also welcome you to follow the Latinx projects and, and CLACs on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, so that you receive updates on our next conversation on immigrant workers in our food system. When Omar first approached me about the possibility of creating a series of discussions on the recasting of immigrants as essential workers, we both knew that we really wanted to invite Dr. Ray and the leadership of the Street Vendor Project. There is many as 20,000 street vendors in New York City, hot dog vendors, pretzel vendors, food trucks, and many other people who sell all sorts of treats. They are small business people struggling to make ends meet. Most are immigrants and people of color. They work long hours under harsh conditions, and we know that we look for them. We look for them at public events. We look for them when we're walking past streets, and we need a bit of sustenance. They ask for nothing more but to sell their goods on public sidewalks. The Street Vendor Project is a membership-based organization with more than 2,000 members who are working together to create a vendor's movement for permanent change. In recent years, vendors have been victims of New York City's aggressive quality of life crackdown. They've been denied vendor license, and they actually receive exorbitant tickets for minor violations. Um, we can talk a bit more about the policing of street vendors um, in this conversation. Beyond the issues they faced before the pandemic, street vendors have been hit hard by COVID as they cannot work and undocumented street vendors cannot access the same economic and social support systems as others. We're excited to host a conversation on these issues and learn more about how these communities are navigating the pandemic. Let me introduce our panelists today. Our moderator for today's discussion is Krishnandu Ray, an associate professor and the department chair in food studies at New York University. Krishnandu received his PhD in sociology from uh, SUNY Binghamton. Prior to joining NYU's faculty in 2005, Krishnandu was a faculty member and acting associate dean at the Culinary Institute of America. As a food study scholar who takes us into, as a food study scholar, he takes us into the kitchens of immigrants and into the kitchens of the restaurants they work in and the entrepreneurs who build these restaurants to explore food ways, race, and ethnic identity. He is the author of several books. His first, The Migrant's Table, Meals and Memories in Bengali American Households, is a fantastic read. And if you haven't gotten his most recent monograph, The Ethnic Restaurant Tour, I would suggest you go and get a copy. Um, it's a fantastic book and I am sure that we'll hear more insight as to how this kind of scholarship shapes his perspective on street vendors. Mohamed Atia, let me introduce the panelists. Mohamed Atia um, 
is director of the Street Vendors Project. He immigrated to the U.S. from Alexandria, Egypt, and he worked as a street vendor for nearly 10 years selling hot dogs, halal chicken, rice, and smoothies. He became a member of the Street Vendor Project in 2012 and was elected to the leadership board. And he served on the board into 2018 when he joined the staff formally as the director. Uh, Karina Kaufman Gutierrez is a Street Vendor Project's deputy director. She is a Colombian American who brings ex her experience in nonprofit management, policy development, restaurants, and community organizing within immigrant communities. She has held several positions um, at NYC Small Business Services, at the Community Services Society, or Service Society, and the Fundación Corona. She holds a master's degree in international affairs and urban social policy from Columbia University. Let's welcome our speakers. And now I turn the virtual mic over to Dr. Ray. Thank you. <clears throat> welcome everyone. And uh, thanks Mira for this really lovely introduction. <clears throat> you have set the table very well for us. And I'm looking forward to today's conversation, which we will go for a little over an hour. Um, we have, I think, about 90 minutes for uh, the conversation and then the Q&A. And, &A. and um, so let me open with, uh, in fact, uh, something uh, that uh, Miraya uh, gestured towards, uh, a little maybe a personal history. Um, Mohammed, tell us a little as to this uh, uh, this. Tra trajectory, this travel of yours uh, from uh, an Egyptian immigrant from Alexandria uh, uh, to becoming a street vendor and then becoming now the director uh, uh, of the Street Vendor Project. Uh, yeah, well, uh, thanks, Dr. Ray, for the wonderful introduction. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. Uh, so, yeah, as an immigrant coming to the United States, coming to pursue the American dream, or what people call the American dream, we'll figure this out later, <laughs> and yeah, just coming here to establish a life, to start a new life that I couldn't really start in my home country. So coming here to New York City, I was like really new in the country, new to the culture, I didn't know much uh, about anything. I didn't know a lot of people. And I was able at the very beginning to work in a bodega as just like a part-time worker to just make ends meet and to make sure I can be independent. And a few months after I started the job uh, that was in East Harlem, uh, I met a street vendor who just happened to be uh, working right across the street from the mosque in 96th Street and 3rd Avenue. When I found uh, the vendor selling halal foods, I was like really impressed. Wow, you have halal food here. Let me buy a plate. Oh, how delicious. It was really good food. I do remember that. And I talked to the vendor like we connected real quickly. He's also Egyptian. And we talked and he kind of like asked me, what am I doing? And what's what job i'm doing here and i told him that i work in a store and he was like oh but in the store you don't really make that much i bet you get paid the minimum wage back then it was 715 so you can't really survive on 715 per hour you can't really buy a car <laughs> or uh cover your expenses with such a minimum wage so he was like how long uh, are you planning to stay in this country what's your plan uh, what's your dream here? And I was like, my dream is to work hard, to save money, to start my own business. I don't know. I'm not going to be working in the store for the rest of my life. And then he was like, what about street vending? What about starting a business in the street? What about uh, starting a micro business that will allow you to grow at some point? Because working in the store and getting 715 is not going to get you anywhere. Not even after 50 years, right? you will barely survive with such a salary. So uh, I was like really interested in the whole idea. And of course it came along with a lot of challenges at the very beginning. And he was like really honest with me. He was like, listen, if you're gonna do this, you have to know what it takes. You're gonna be out in the freezing cold or uh, the extremely hot weather, uh, dealing with everything, being out on the street. It's not as being in a store with camera surveillance around you and all of that. That's not the case, right? You're out in the street means you are literally out in the street. You're on your own. 
you are the most vulnerable worker in the whole city. That's that's what being a street vendor is. And I was like, yes, I would really accept that and take the challenge and let me get it started. That's how it all started with vending. I got a food vendor license. I went back and I met with him again and I asked him to hook me up with a job. So he connected me with somebody he knows who has a halal food cart. So I was working with him. I worked with him for a while. Then I jumped from one place to another till I got a job in Times Square on a hot dog cart, hot dog and pretzels. So for anyone listening, if you ever stop by Times Square between 2010 and 2015, I definitely sold you a hot dog or a pretzel, 99%, no chance you miss me. So yeah, that, that was the whole story. I saved money working on the hot dog stand. And then with my best friend, Ahmed, who came years after, he also worked hard, saved some money, and we put money together and we started our uh, small business, our first uh, juice and smoothie cart. So this is a little bit well, that's about- in fact, That's in fact a beautiful story. And that's a very typical New York story. And, and this is like what people get into the, uh, the ethnic relationship becomes an informal consulting relationship, right? Which tells you what businesses you can do. That's how we end up with say, uh, that has happened before with say Italian immigrants. It has happened with Jewish immigrants. Uh, it has happened with Greek diners. It has happened with Korean green grocers. And so this kind of an ethnic succession happens today with uh, cab drivers. So kind of, that's a kind of a beautiful example of in fact, an old American story how certain kinds of skills are passed along within communities because people have less access to formal resources, that you cannot go to a bank to get a loan, that you cannot go to a consulting agency to get uh, kind of a, without paying a lot of money to get consulting. That's why we end up with what sociologists call ethnic enclaves. And so why certain communities of people cluster in certain businesses. And Yord Muhammad is a terrific example of a substantial presence of, say, Egyptian uh, street vendors on that. Maybe I'll go to uh, 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 Karina now and we'll come back to your trajectory as an officer uh, of the Street Vendor Project. Karina, first a little about yourself as to um, uh, how you came to work for Street Vendor Project, what is so interesting about it. Uh, and uh, a second part of the question is a little more about uh, what Mireya said, there are about 20,000 vendors in New York City. How would, you, uh, how would you classify them? How many are food vendors? How many are non-food vendors? How many, what are the major languages spoken, uh, et cetera? So first, a little bit about yourself and then about kind of the demographic map of street vendors in New York City. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much for having us tonight, Krish. Um, and thanks to all the folks who are here listening in. Um, so I actually, I started at SVP about nine months ago. Mm. Um, and my background is a little, a little all over the place. And SVP is actually the perfect centering point of um, the different backgrounds that I have. Um, so for example, I, you know, food and small businesses have always been a really huge part of my life. Um, for about a decade, I worked in and out of restaurants, both front of house and back of house as a line cook. Um, and that really has been the foundation of how I approach looking at street vending um, and being within this community. Um, and then from there, I've really, you know, gone on to then do research on community led development at Small Business Services and the Community Service Society. Um, and, you know, in my, in my outside of SVP role, um, focus on neighborhood-based organizing in Queens, where I'm at. Um, where it's grounded really in the most pressing issues of what's going on in our neighborhoods, um, whether it be ice presence, whether it be over-policing of our neighborhoods, whether it be the lack of affordable housing or not having multilingual access to mm. both to services or just information in general. Um, and you know, I'm really I'm grateful to be have to have that um, neighborhood-based organizing experience in my in who I am and where I've, where I've like developed from because it's so different often from, you know, larger nonprofits that not even including SVP, but other, other larger nonprofits where you, you think about different things um, like funding, you think about elected officials, you think about um, 
uh, you know, it can, it can sometimes not be so grounded in exactly what's the issue and how are we going to tackle it as a community. And I think that's something we actually do really well at SVP because, you know, Muhammad and I and other folks have, have that grounding and, and understanding of the issues that we take on are directly from what our members express. And that's how we lead, that's how we lead the organization. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about who street vendors are. Yep, good. Yeah, so uh, they're about, as mentioned by Mireya in the beginning, there are about 20,000 street vendors all across New York City um, in the five boroughs. There's folks in Staten Island too. Um, and there's a mix of folks who sell, um, who are considered First Amendment, um, First Amendment street vendors, so folks who sell um, art, newspapers, anything that falls under the freedom of speech. Um, there are folks who sell uh, what are considered, they be considered general merchandise vendors. So selling clothing or different um, things like cell phone cases. Um, and then there's food vendors who you know, are really the focus of our conversation today. And that's, you know, that's a mix of folks who have, um, are working in permitted carts. So some of the more traditional like touristic idea of of hot dogs, pretzels. Um, and then there's also folks who often don't have permits. Um, and those are folks who are, who are often more in the outer boroughs who are selling um, mangos, tamales, um, and, and are, you know, again, a huge part, a huge part of their neighborhoods. Um, and then in terms of who, who makes up street vendors? And so for instance, out of that, say, uh, 20,000 vendors in all, including First Amendment, how many would be food vendors approximately? I'm actually, you know, we can think about it in terms of like licenses and permits because okay, that's- Okay, good. Tell, tell, yeah, yeah. tell us a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. There are about 5,000 permits um, for food vendors and 853 for- 853 licenses for general merchandise vendors. So there are, there are often a lot more food vendors than, than others. And you said, uh, for instance, there would be uh, vendors, especially in the outer boroughs. And I think in one of your report, I read also often women, uh, Latinx women, uh, for instance, uh, 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 why might some vendors not have a, a permit? What is, an, what is an obstacle, do you think, in, in getting a permit? Yeah, this is, you know, this is really often the crux of, of one of the challenges that we're tackling as an organization. There has been a cap on uh, mobile food vendor permits since, 19, since the 1980s. Hmm. Um, and so there's absolutely, there's just no way to get one. There's a waiting list of a decade. You know, we've had members who've come into the Street Vendor Project who say, guess what? I, you know, was in the lottery and on the wait list for 15 years. And I just got one. I see. So it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's, it's next to impossible. How does one get one, one of those lottery things? How does one get one of those permits? Someone has to die? Someone has to pass it along? Uh, sort of that, Krish. So okay. how it works, yeah, how it works. And I can tell you a little bit about my personal story with good, the permits yeah. and how I learned about it because I had no idea what a permit is at the very beginning, right? Uh, some people won't teach you everything. And now, thanks to the Street Vendor Project, that where I actually learned a lot about street vending, and I was able, after learning, to start my own business. So uh, back in 2009, when I got my food vendor license, and back then, the instructor of the Department of Health who's giving the course uh, tell us, hey, after you get your license, go sign up for permit. Go sign up, put your name on the waiting list so you can get a permit one day that you need the permit for the card. So once I received the license, even before like getting the job, I was like, okay, it sounds like a waiting list. I might wait for some time. Let me go put my name on. That was in 2009. And when I walked into the Department of Consumer Affairs office, people were like laughing at me. Like, what? You want to put your name on the waiting list? There is no such a thing here. I was like, <laughs> why that? They said the waiting list is closed two years ago. I see. And the city closed the waiting list because they had 2,500 names on it. And they said, enough. We're not going to take anyone else. So later on, I joined the Street Vendor Project. I learned about this whole thing 
happen. There is no more permits. And the way it works with the city that somebody who owns a permit now from those 5,000 permits out there, someone who holds the permit dies or stop renewing the permit for any reason. Imagine if I'm a permit owner, like for instance, I received a lot of violations on my permit. I can't afford to pay those fines. I will give it up. Once that happens, that goes to the next person on the waiting list, who now at least like the newest person on the waiting list will be in the waiting list for the last 13 years. Wow. People have been on the waiting list even for more than that. So th this is how it works. They get the letter like, hey, we finally have an opening spot for you. We have a permit. Let us know if you want to apply. And then by the time, like maybe 13 years ago, some of those people were really interested in the thing, but now they are doing something else. Now they are driving a cab. They are driving with Uber. They are working in a restaurant. And when they receive this letter, I mean, ideally, if you're not interested in the business, you will just ignore it, right? If I receive the letter now, hey, come work with us in such and such job, I'm fine. I have a job. Why would I care? But now people actually care. And that takes us to the next part of what this limit on the number of permits created. A lot of before people- we, Hey, before we get there, uh, Mohammed, so, mm -hmm. uh, so you didn't get, they laughed at you to join the uh, lucky list. So what then, what did you do? Uh, I said, thank you. And I left. That's what I did. <laughs> and then I went back, I, I went back to look for a job and I work with people and it took me years to understand what's happening. People in the vending business usually talk about the permit as it's that kind of thing flying in the ether that doesn't exist. You can't touch it. It's very dangerous. You can't talk about it. But then I figured out that there is a huge underground market for it. Okay. And for me to start a business, I have to deal with that system. Otherwise, I can't start my own business. I can't have a nice fancy truck or cart. I can't be out there doing my job, selling, and get arrested anytime. If any police officer stop by the cart, they can arrest me. They can give me a $1,000 ticket. And they can take my whole cart, which is my life savings. So how much did it cost you to get that... Um... Uh, access to a permit, which also might explain why some of the people can't afford to get a permit. Yeah. So at the beginning of 2013, when we started our first uh, smoothie cart, we couldn't afford to deal with the full uh, term permit. So there is a full term permit just for context. People will be confused. Yeah. There is a full term permit that works for two years period. And every two years you can renew it. And then there is a seasonal permit that works in the summertime only. The seasonal permit starts in April and ends in October. And you have to renew that every year. So back then at the time, the underground market price was about between 18 to $20,000. Wow. And we couldn't wow. afford to spend that. Yeah. That's a lot of money. And maybe also for context, what does it mean to deal with the underground market? You're not gonna walk to the broker or whomever in charge of the permit and sign a lease or a contract. You're not going to have a payment plan and direct them some checks from your bank. That all doesn't happen. What happens in the permit world that everything happens under the table, everything happens in cash. There is absolutely no protection for you as a vendor. Absolutely nothing. So even before the government, before the health department, the permit owner is considered the business owner. The permit owner is considered the cart owner. And we have seen that sometimes when the permit owner abused this authority sometimes and when they have a problem with the vendor, they would go there with the police to take the cart, even if the cart is not theirs. But they have the sticker on it that has their name and they say, oh, now I'm the owner of the permit, I'm, I'm the owner of the cart, this guy stole my cart. We have seen this happening several times. So yeah, back then the price was about eighteen to $20,000. We couldn't afford it. So we choose to work only on the summertime. And that's why we went with a seasonal permit that cost back then about $5,000 just to work for seven months period. Mm, I see. And um, in fact, that reminds me, Karina, uh, uh, about the uh, Muhammad's example is a good example. Uh, what are some of the uh, major languages spoken amongst your members? And what are the challenges of, in some ways, running an organization because I remember uh, when I first went to your first membership meeting, I was blown away. 
because the only other organization where I had been where there was a simultaneous translation was it a big uh, kind of highfalutin United Nations uh, event. Uh, so A, what are the major languages of your organization? And what are some of the challenges? And in fact, the, the, the fun part about working with people with so many native languages. Yeah, so the majority of our members um, are most comfortable in Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic, and Bangla. And that's not to say, you know, there's also folks who are more comfortable in, in French, in Hindi. There's, you know, we have, I think that's one of the beautiful things about this profession of street vending is that folks, you know, are, are coming from all different parts of the world and coming to New York City and this is really the entryway for so many people to setting their roots in New York City. Um, and I would say in terms of thinking about, um, in terms of thinking about our, our multicultural organizing, it's also, you know, when, we, when we're organizing, it's one of the few places I've ever seen, as you're mentioning, that has um, not just we're working together for the same issues, but we're also learning from one another about how each person came into this profession, about what they're specifically facing in their, in their communities and also in their neighborhoods. Because um, our membership comes from, again, all across the five boroughs. So people are coming from different, different backgrounds, different, um, different geographies to come and meet at this one, this one place. And I would say, um, in thinking through the challenges of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, interpretation is, is beautiful, but it's expensive. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's our commitment to language justice. Um, and that's, you know, even as we we're mentioning before, that's something we're not seeing the city government do. Even in these times of crisis and COVID, our staff internally has been rapidly translating a lot of the, the key information that's being passed out about health and safety, about, you know, reopening New York, about COVID. Like, that's, that's something that it, that information was not getting to the communities who are the most impacted. And that's a huge portion of our work is to make sure that that information is reaching folks. Um, and I would just say the only tricky thing about it at this time is just the virtual transition. Yeah. Um, it's so much, we're so accustomed to being in person, you know, people speak with their hands, not even just through, they speak with their eyes, they speak with like their facial expressions and that communicates so much as well. And so to be transitioning that into this virtual space um, where there's not just, you know, difficulty with, with interpretation through the mediums that we have, but also I think there's a digital divide as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, some folks might be more accustomed to, to using platforms like Zoom or, or Skype, but it really has been quite an adjustment in terms of um, how we organize internally to make sure that language justice is present even through um, these, these online virtual meetings that we do with our members. And in fact, you did a, a nice segue into, in fact, what are the challenges of like in the context of COVID-19? And one is a communication challenge and the modes of communicating. And maybe I'll pitch one, one thing quickly. If anyone in the audience is multilingual in those languages that Karina just pointed out, uh, please come and volunteer probably and contact Karina. And that is one of the most useful ways one can support an organization like Street Vendor Project, in fact. Uh, so it's Arabic, uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Bengali, uh, Mandarin, uh, and in fact, sometimes French, um, uh, and uh, what was the other language? I think Hindi, sometimes Hindi. Uh, so coming back to this question of the, the context of COVID-19, uh, Mohammed or Karina, uh, what are, I mean, uh, I cannot imagine how someone can be a street vendor and survive three months of no uh, sale and no contact. So A, describe for our audience a bit about what the vendors are facing and, and B, what you have been trying to make the city uh, do, uh, including things like Karina mentioned, which is start communicating in the languages in which people understand it. Other than that, so what are the challenges uh, vendors are facing and what are some of the things you are putting pressure on the city? Uh, Mohammed? Yeah, so like briefly, as you mentioned, Krish, it is really crazy situation that street vendors are dealing with. 
most people stopped working completely since mid-March when this pandemic hit the city and people received absolutely no income. And what has been even hard was like even harder than this financial uh, crisis that is hitting everyone is that everything was so ambiguous to them. There was no resources. There is no access to anything. I had people calling me literally every day asking me what the hell is going on? What's going to happen? What's next? Do you have any updates? I mean, even till now, because people go online and go to the websites of the government and there is absolutely nothing useful to them. There is nothing in their language. There is no resources for them to explain what's happening. And I don't really blame them. I mean, if I read any resources that not in my language and I find it really hard to understand, I'll just skip it, right? So the city officials haven't spent enough time and enough energy on reaching out to our communities. And that has been, of course, a big uh, challenge for us. We're trying to reach about 2,000 of our members. How would we do that? We are only five or six people working in the staff. We did everything we can. We reach out to as many people as possible. Like in the past three months, we contacted several hundred of our members and everyone even multiple times. But not only the resources and not only what's happening and what's going on right now, but when you talk about the financial crisis, not only for them as small business owners, but also as workers, as individuals, it's hitting them at every level. Mm. Like when you, when you talk about a small business owner till now, I don't know any street vendor, and I know a lot. I can tell you that. I know a mm. lot of people who work as street vendors. Not even a single person received a dollar from the federal government or the local government to support their businesses. Not even a dollar in grant or loan. And now, a lot of people might think, of course, like if you don't know much about street vending, you think, oh, but it's a lot better for the street vendors than restaurants. They don't have rent. They don't have a lot of expenses. They don't have overhead, so they should be fine. They can go back to work tomorrow. Interestingly enough, yesterday I just talked to one of our members who has a food truck who said, I need at least $7,000 today to be able to go back tomorrow to work. And I was like, oh my God, why you have, why you need $7,000? That's a lot of money. And then he listed to me the expenses. He needs to pay about four months of rent to the commissary that he parks his truck at. He needs to pay hey, the hey, four- just before you go on, explain to people, what is a commissary? Yeah. Yeah, the commissary is a garage for the food carts and trucks. So any food cart or truck cannot park anywhere in the city. They have to park in what's called the commissary, which is a certified facility by the Department of Health to park, clean, and serve these food carts and, and uh, trucks. And there are so, about what, 50 commissaries in the- uh, About in 100, the, about, about 106 100. of them, yeah. 100 or 106 of them uh, serving all across the five boroughs. And yeah, the rent is a big burden. I mean, okay. he, pays, he pays about $1,000 in rent every month. And that doesn't really reflect anything. Even if he's not making a dollar and the truck is sitting in the garage, he still has to pay that much money. Mm. Uh, the insurance, the insurance for the vehicle he has, uh, the worker's compensation he has for the business, uh, all the expenses and the bills that he owes, the balance he has for this commissary for the past uh, three or four months of the merchandise that he lost pre-COVID. And he needs a lot of supply to just go back to work because all the food is gone, all the materials in the truck is gone. And you can imagine it's the same situation with every vendor in different scales. Mm. Even for fresh produce vendors, they lost thousands of dollars on merchandise, on fresh produce when this pandemic first hit. And what have they received? Really nothing. So what did you guys do, Karina? Did you guys do fundraising or? Yes, so we, um, we've we been fundraising for, for you know, direct cash assistance that we can be doing to support our members. Um, so we had a GoFundMe that's still still ongoing. Oh, could you share it with us? Maybe after the meeting, we can send out to people if they want to help. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the topics that Mohammed just covered, that's, that's really focusing on um, vendors as business professionals, right? Mm -hmm. But then also thinking about vendors as people, as, you know, their own struggles outside of their business. Vendors are coming from the communities that have been the most impacted 
by COVID health-wise, family-wise, neighborhood-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we also have to think, you know, folks have been without work for three months. Not only can they not pay their commissary rent, they can't pay their residential rent. Mm-hmm. They can't pay for their apartments. Um, they have kids who are now home from school. So they have to be home with them because they can't afford daycare because they're out of school. Um, folks are undocumented. They've received not a penny from the city, the state, or the federal government. And so when you think about all these different factors combined, um, you're not receiving support both as, as a small business owner, but also as a human, as somebody who lives in New York City and as a resident of this so-called sanctuary city that provides you know, and, and amplifies the, the immigrant voices of New York City as what makes the city great. And then they're completely left out in the cold. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. And so uh, in, in kind of a, this kind of a, a challenge, I'm thinking uh, it, this moment is a really uh, st- stressful and a depressing moment. How do you keep, how do you guys keep your spirit up and you guys have had a couple of recent victories around it. Maybe we'll get to talk about it. And one of them, um, uh, Karina, uh, you mentioned this broader frame of being uh, a human being in New York City, uh, rent, n- not being able to pay personal uh, household rent, and also in terms of police action and stuff like that. So the first question is, uh, how do you keep your spirits high? What makes you fight uh, and keep fighting every day? I mean, Mohammed, our, or Karina, Karina, go, go for it. Yeah. I was going to say our members, mm. um, our members are what keep us fighting and we're not just fighting the two of us. We're fighting as a force of our members together. Um, and so, you know, we're, we have a really active WhatsApp chat with folks and that's, you know, we're practicing multilingual organizing in our WhatsApp chats as well. Um, but we're also seeing folks share like really sweet messages that are uplifting one another as well. Um, and this is, this is part of what, what keeps each other going, what keeps um, our entire membership feeling active and engaged and hopeful because they see that so many other people who are in the same position as them are in it together. Yeah. Do you guys collaborate with other organizations in other cities, other places? Yes, actually. So one of the one of the beautiful things that's come out of this crisis is the community building that we're able to do, not just internally, but with our partner organizations of street vendors across the nation. Um, and so when things were starting to get really crazy and we're all like, nothing is no, all of this information, all of these resources keep coming out and nothing is reaching our communities. We're like, you know, it's not just us. This must, this is happening to our, our family and friends um, from our partner organizations in California, in LA, in uh, Washington, DC, and in Chicago. And so we had just kind of an exploratory first meeting um, that happened because someone was like, hey, I saw that you guys aren't getting this either, like over email. How do we, you know, we're not doing this either. Let's come up with a way um, to address this as a coalition on a national front. And so we developed a um, national coalition for street vendor justice with folks from the four different cities. And like for instance, for LA, um, I mean, the great news uh, LA before COVID-19 was that uh, they had presumably legalized street vending, right? It was illegal. So what was the upside and what's kind of the downside of uh, like something that's happening, say in LA compared to uh, New York City? Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, the funny part about what happened in LA that although the legislation and legalizing street vending in California state has passed over a year ago, I would say more than a year and a half ago, as for now, that's what we're hearing from the news. There are only 10 licensed, fully licensed street vendors in LA. 10. 10 people out of tens of thousands of dollars across LA. So this actually tells you how the city bureaucracy is just slowing down everything. How the fees are so high that people cannot afford it. How the process is so long and so complicated. It's very good to look progressive. It's very good 
to look sanctuary, but it's a lot better to actually be. Hmm. If that makes so sense. Fact, that sounds like a lot of words for 10 and a lot of credit for 10 uh, legal vendors in LA for the size of it, right? Uh, and yeah, I mean, f- f- folks in LA estimate there are 50,000 street vendors. That's crazy. What happened to all these people in a whole 2019? There was a whole year to legalize and streamline the process of giving out license and permits for people to let them work in a legal way. And that hasn't happened. Mm, I see. And actually, right at the start, right at the start of COVID and everything shutting down, vendors in LA were not allowed to work anymore. Um, they would have received fines or even faced arrest if they were working during the time of the shutdown. Um, and I think one of the challenges that they're facing now is when something similar that's happening in New York is that there's a movement now for restaurants to have open dining. Um, so because um, restaurants, if they're, um, they can't open to full capacity to, in order to keep social distancing. And so there's movements in cities across, across the country um, for restaurants to be able to have sidewalk dining. Um, and on the one hand, this is, you know, This is really amazing um, for restaurants, for New York City to be able to start coming back to normal. But I think the the perspective that's lost in in not just the legislation, but in um, the push for outdoor dining is is street vendors. Is street vendors who have fought and been criminalized for working um, and setting up their businesses in the streets and sidewalks and now are at risk of being completely displaced from where they've set up um, in the interest of supporting another struggling small business. So it's really- I see. Is that, what is it called? Is that intro 1957 or what is it called? Is that the, is that the law? Yeah, it's Uh, it's a proposal, intro 19. It's a proposal. Okay. And, and you are saying in the proposal, there's no accounting for, no discussing opportunities for street vendors. And in fact, often the drawings look like they're cleaning the streets uh, for, uh, uh, for the restaurants to expand, but no room for the street vendors to act. Right? Well, yeah, that's, that's pretty much right, uh, Krish. The thing is with the legislation, the language is very vague. The language is not saying anything specific. So there is absolutely no protection for street vendors. I see. So according to what the language is, if I have a restaurant, I can throw out as many chairs and tables as I want and displace any vendor in front of me or down my block. And that's what we are trying to get a better sense of. Yes, we need the city to step up and support restaurants. We can't let our restaurants struggle alone. We have to support them. But we also have to think about street vendors. We can't, you can't help one small business and hurt the other. That would be the stupidest thing to ever do. They can't do that. But of course, they are not spending enough time and they are not thinking through the whole process enough. And that's why we have been there advocating for the street vendors. We have been there in the city hall uh, and the city council hearing to testify and explain what their plan is. Because a lot of people, when they write the law, they don't know what happens in the real life. They mm-hmm. write the law and they think, hey, this legislation is great. It's going to help everybody. But then in the real life, it might be disruptive to most people. Hmm. I see. And maybe this is the time, right time to focus. Maybe are there any other laws or bills uh, that are coming up at the city council mm-hmm. at the New York City level uh, that you guys are working towards? Yeah, we have been working on a campaign for the past six years to increase the number of permits. And I just want to clarify, I'm not sure if everyone is following, but there is a uh, distinguish, there is a difference between the permit and license. I need people to be aware of that. Good, yeah. So, yeah, for you to operate a food vending business, you need a food vendor license for yourself as a vendor, which is not a problem. It is not limited. You can get one of those. But also you are required to have a food vending permit for the cart or the truck you are selling from. And here comes the challenge. Those and that is what is restricted. Permit. It is the permit that is restricted. That's right. It is limited okay. to only 5,000 permits across the city. Now, what that means, if I have a food vendor license, can I go and work and sell food? Ideally, yes. But according to the law, no. If I don't have a permit on my, on my card, I am doing what's called unpermitted vending. I see. And I explain the risk of that. I can get arrested can get my whole uh, merchandise and card confiscated. 
and I can get a thousand dollar ticket. So now we have been asking the city to fix the system that they created back in 1983 when the city council was actually running by big corporation and real estate interests. Whatever happened in 1983 is like too old for 2020. And I think now the city needs to step up and fix the system. Everybody in the city council, everybody in, in the administration knows that the vending system is broken. Everybody admits that they have been talking about it over and over in events and newspapers outside in the public. So everyone knows that there is a system that's broken that needs to be fixed. But yet we haven't seen the leadership of the city stepping up and saying, we will fix it now. And that's what we need. Like 36 years of dealing or 37 years of dealing with underground markets with a broken vending system that criminalize the work of these hardworking immigrants is really crazy and unacceptable. So with all of that context, there has been a legislation in the city council that was introduced in 2018. We had a hearing on it last year. What this legislation will do basically, it will uh, create a new vending permitting system. It will create a new kind of permit that people cannot sell or rent in the underground market. The permit will be attached to the vendor. So the vendor themselves can use the permit to operate on the cart. And instead of giving it to somebody else, and take a lot of cash for it. And that uh, system will create 400 new of these permits every year gradually for the next 10 years. But also it will create a new enforcement agency that will oversee street vending. And that's also very important and very connecting to what the mayor announced uh, last Sunday. Last Sunday, out of the blue, the mayor said, NYPD will not enforce street vending anymore which is something we have been asking for, fighting for and marching for, for the past 19 years. Finally, he listens to that. I'm not sure which one, which protest, which action he listened to before he came out and uh, announced this, but that was great announcement. But also it is not really clear what's gonna happen next. It is not clear which agency will be responsible for the street vending, but we know, and I, I really need people to know that, the NYPD is not the only agency that enforces street vending laws. The list of agencies is very long. Department of Health, Department of Sanitation, D Department of Transportation with the food trucks, uh, Department of Parks and Recreation, Department of Consumer Affairs. All these agencies literally go around and write tickets for street vendors. So the enforcement is not over. The enforcement is still happening, but we need to understand Who's gonna be the next player? If it's not the NYPD, are you creating a new agency that will work with the community, that will support them, that will try to fix the problems and work around them and recommend uh, legislation to the city council to fix this broken system? Or are you creating a new agency that will keep, keep going around writing thousands of dollars of tickets for every vendor in the city? So is that, does, that, does that make people more anxious in some ways? That Indeed, uncertainty, I mean, does it increase the uncertainty? Indeed, a lot of people mm. are so worried now, they don't know what's gonna happen next. Of course, getting the NYPD out of the street vending, that was the bare minimum that we needed. I mean, like last year, we had a, a study that surveyed 50 women and 70% of the women who were surveyed stated that they feel scared when they see the NYPD. People who sell without permits, you can imagine that someone go to work every day and be terrified when they see a cop. That shouldn't be the case, right? Mm. I read a little bit about the NYPD and they say, our mission is to keep the community safe. That's not being safe. If I'm out in the street, I'm feeling scared. I'm not feeling safe by the presence of the NYPD. So how come we reach that point? We reach that point because the policy they have, the policy that's made in the NYPD that go out and give these vendors tickets every day. That's what they are taught to do. And that's what they do. For every little violation, for every minor violation, a police officer can stop by a vendor and write them a thousand dollar ticket. And how come the administration accept that? How come the city accepts that? So that's really interesting. So are, you guys, are you guys trying to change that with this intro bill, intro 1116? Um, and where is that bill? Um, is it, so, it is pretty close to passing or is there some obstacles to it? 
Yeah, so that's that's one of the goals we are trying to reach with this legislation. If the legislation passes, if this unit is created, we really want to be there when this unit is being created and built and these agents are being trained. And we really want to be there on the conversation to make sure that this unit will be constructive. We don't want a unit to be out there penalizing people for doing work. And, and the legislation now is in a very good stage. If people are familiar with the legislation process now. Uh, explain to us, explain to us a little, yeah. Yeah, sure. So first the legislation was introduced back in September and the next step after the legislation was introduced was to have a hearing. So we had a public hearing on it last year in April where hundreds of vendors were out there, dozens of organizations were out there supporting uh, the bill, supporting the legislation and saying that this is the right thing to do to support the street vending community. And after the hearing, a lot of discussions happen, a lot of negotiations happen. And meanwhile, during the hearing time and even after, many council members were signing the bill, even before it's pushed for a vote. A lot of people now are co-sponsors. The bill has 30 co-sponsors, including of, the public. Out advocate. of how many people? Out of how many councillors? Yeah, 29 council members out of 51 council members. So that's okay. majority, that's almost vast majority of the city council. So the bill is very close to pass. Uh, we have the vast majority of the uh, committee, which is Committee on Consumer Affairs. Most of the votes are on the bill. Most of the members of this committee support the bill. And all we need for this bill to happen is for the speaker to call for a vote on it. I see. We have seen that this bill is out. It has been there and it's not the first time. We had a similar bill in the last city council session that had also about 22 co-sponsors. And back then it was supported by the speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, and it was killed in the last minute by the mayor. So who's the, the speaker mayor? now? Who's the speaker now? The and speaker people, can now people is, call him up and talk to him? Yeah, please. The speaker ah. is, is Cody Johnson from I District see. 3 in Manhattan. If you live in District 3 in Manhattan, please pick up the phone and call your council member and tell him speaker, Please pass the bill. Pass intro 1116. Please remember the number. Intro 1116. Excellent. Uh, and uh, uh, could you give us a few examples? We'll have about a few more minutes and then we'll open it up for some uh, Q&A. Uh, a couple of examples of what kind of tickets people get and how, what this A, this bill. And before this, you guys have worked on reducing uh, the f penalties, for instance, uh, and like give, give us an example of the kind of rules people have to follow if you have, say, even if you uh, 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 have a street card and, and you're working on it, what are some of the rules? So people have a sense of what you need to keep on top of not to get a ticket. Wow, that, that's a big question, <laughs> Chris. Okay, just give, it, give us three examples. Yeah, three yeah. Examples. I'll, I'll give you a quick example, maybe a yeah. quick overview. What's happening for any street vendor? They have to follow all the rules and regulations that falls in different agencies. So for food vendors, for example, they have to follow the administrative code and the health code. The health code for street vendor, for food vendors, are pretty much the same of the restaurants. I see. The same health code that applies to restaurants applies to street vendors. Now, when it gets to place- oh, By the way, do street vendors get a, a letter grade now? They do, they do for the past couple of years. And okay. if you walk around in some places, you will find them have the letter and 85% of them have an A, just an wow. FYI for people. Good. Most vendors get an A, that's awesome. So yeah, just quickly, when it gets to the administrative code, you have a lot of restrictions that you have to follow. There are a very long list, about 30 pages long list of streets that are restricted for street vending. No vendor can be there at certain times. There are a lot of other rules and measurements that vendors have to keep, like 10 feet away from the crosswalk, 20 feet away from every entrance, and you can't be on a bus stop, you can't be on a taxi stand. So the rules and regulations are very hard. And that's why I always say that it's pretty impossible and it's really, really hard to find a spot that is good for business, but also legal to operate in. And to talk a little bit about the tickets and about the violations, Back in 2006, under the Bloomberg administration, 
they raised the fine subtly from $250 to $1,000. So which means that any NYPD officer can write any vendor a ticket and just put $1,000 in the ticket. And then the vendor has to pay that. And these violations used to be as tiny as being few inches closer to the crosswalk. For example, I must be 10 feet away from the crosswalk all the time with the cart. If that measures nine feet and six inches, that's a violation. I could pay $1,000 for that. And that's the kind of violation, that's the kind of tickets that the NYPD used to give to vendors who work with license and permits. So even when you have the license and permits, you are always a target for these violations. Oh my God, you're not hanging your license in your chest. That's a violation. I oh, see. you're too close to the crosswalk. You're not too close to the curb. All these minor violations that cost thousands of dollars. To go back to the campaign you talked about with lowering the fine, the Street Vendor Project has started a lowering the fine campaign back in 2006, all the way to 2013, when we were able to uh, reduce the fines back to $500. So now the fines that uh, the vendors receive for the administrative code goes gradually from $50 the first time to $500 the fourth time. But of course, that doesn't apply to the health code. So again, the health code is still a limited people. I've seen tickets violations for $1,200 for a vendor who didn't have paper towel in their cart. You see how crazy the enforcement gets and how the fines can be sometimes. Oh, I see a lots of questions. So I'm going to move over to the question from the audience. You guys are ready? Some of these are tough, man. Yes. So the first one starts, uh, uh, do you know what the price for these black market permits are now? Has the price increased? You can give short answers and we can yeah. take more questions too. Now they go for up to $25,000. Okay. Uh, someone says, well, uh, NYIC also works on language access. Some people ask, uh, Karina, for instance, how can we help with translation remotely? Uh, uh, Fatema says, Oh, where is it? There it is. Uh, I would be happy to help with Spanish and Persian if there's such need. Yes, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think there's um, there's a number of other organizations, you know, that reach different populations, and we are often working in coalition to make sure that the information is getting translated rapidly, um, as well as just our own internal materials. You know, like everything that we produce as an organization to communicate with our members has to be in all of the, the languages that we spoke about before. So there's definitely um, definitely ways to get involved. Let's chat. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and we will uh, send out the contact information. Uh, Ellis, I think, asked, New York City has on the book several language access policies. Um, uh, what good, if any, have these done for SVP members? Yeah, so I, I can talk a little bit about the rules and regulations for vending. Like finally, after years of our famous vendor power book that we issued for our members, the health department copied what we did. They did what we did exactly in different languages and they sent them out. But again, it is really not enough and it's not reaching everybody. Is there an, a contact email to, volu to volunteer for the organization? Yes, you can reach out to us at svp at urbanjustice.org. That would be amazing. Excellent. And one of the question Jacqueline had asked and you had addressed, what's your opinion about Mayor de Blasio moving vendor enforcement away from NYPD to civilian agency? I think your answer was the consequences are unclear and uncertain right now, right? Mm. Yes. Exactly. Let's see. Uh, Okay, so uh, Nemi asks, won't a lot of people be scared of eating? This keeps moving. Street food once New York City is back open and street vendors can operate. What are street vendors doing to ensure a contactless experience? Yeah, so actually um, street food vendors were considered essential workers throughout, um, throughout the closing of New York City. So many folks have continued to work. Um, but people are, are using creative ways um, to implement social distancing, and they're also upkeeping with Department of Health um, regulations as they were before, before the pandemic. So a lot of folks that we've seen, um, we saw somebody who even put up like the plastic, uh, plastic, what's it called, like sheeting 
similar to how you'll see in a, in a deli or in a bodega to separate themselves from customers. So that's one way. Um, folks are using um, cones and caution tape to kind of block out the six foot radius around them. And then also, you know, having multilingual signs that say keep social distancing or that describe what's going on with COVID, why it's important to put your mask over your nose, thing, things like that. Um, you know, vendors are on the ground. They're the ones who are out in the streets. They're the ones who people are talking to because they're of the community that they work in. And so they're really vital to make sure this information is spread. Whitey asks, what's most scary to food vendors, police or crime? Well, I don't I know whether it's an option, but yes. I, well, yeah, it, it, that's a tough choice and a tough question. But yeah. I spent I spent ten years of my life as a street vendor, and I was never scared of a crime. But I was always scared of a police officer writing me a thousand dollar ticket. I see, I see. And uh, can you share a link or more information on this the coalition you guys are building with other street vendors in other cities? Maybe we'll share it at the end of this process and send it out to all the people. Um, so Nemi asks, uh, why do you think the government does not want to help out street vendors and give them such a hard time? It wants, Nemi wants you to look into the heart of the government and well, tell us what's going on. Yeah, well, I can tell you it's a number of reasons, but the main reason I would say which has been changing lately thanks to the grassroots movement, thanks to organizing, the lack of recognition of street vendors as small businesses. Back in the days, everything that the city government did to support small businesses had absolutely nothing to do with the street vendors. How they treat street vendors usually is nothing but enforcement, tickets, fines, and we have seen this over the past uh, two decades of the existence of the street vendor project. But lately, I would tell you that things have been changing slightly. Not enough, of course, but it has been changing slightly that now when they talk about small businesses, they are including the street vendors. When the uh, mayor made the announcement about NYPD enforcement, maybe the first thing they thought about street vendors. When the mayor created this advisory council, they invited the street vendor project to be a part of the small business advisory council. So that's all a result of our work, our movement, the leaders of the street vendor project, the members who take it to the streets every time there is something wrong to advocate. So yes, the lack of recognition is very important. Not being progressive enough, that's another fact. We can't really hide it. People don't care enough about immigrant communities. They don't care enough about undocumented people who don't have social security number. Although they pay taxes, although they have item number, although they do everything that a legitimate business does, but they are being treated illegitimately. So uh, one of the question is, do New York City, this is Joseph, do New York City food vendors have access to credit? Under what conditions and what is the source of credit? Because credit is an important tool, how to survive between so paychecks between business ups and downs. So what, what is the situation? So the situation will depend from one individual to another. It will mm -hmm. differ. So folks who are documented have social security numbers. They usually have credit. They are usually able to deal with the government, deal with banks, with financial institutions, and things are fine. Now for folks who are undocumented, the situation is very different. And it's even harder to deal with a number of financial institutions. It's a lot harder to open a bank account. It's a lot harder, harder to open a credit card. So all of these factors are different from one person to another. But as a street vendor, as a food vendor business, if you are not setting up your business in a way that looks like a corporation or a different model, you won't really qualify for anything. Mm. If I apply for a business loan using my sales tax ID, as a sole proprietor, I will get absolutely nothing. And that's what we have seen now with the government. I see. Like back in the days in March, when we talked to the, uh, the past commissioner, uh, Greg Bishop of SBS, he mentioned that all these government grants and loans won't be, uh, won't be eligible, won't be uh, available for sole proprietors. And they were thinking about having more grants and more programs that will support sole proprietors. So for Karina, this is a big question uh, from Jacob, who I know is a radical because he was my student. 
Uh, he says, how does the victory around getting NYPD out of street vendor enforcement relate to the larger struggle happening around the role of police in our society? And what can the experience of street vendors contribute to that conversation? That's a great question. Um, I think it's, you know, and this is something that we've been having a lot of conversations with our members about to talk about the role of policing in their lives. Um, and really one of the correlation points that people have been understanding is that, um, or relating to, is that vendors were never criminals, right? Street vendors have never been criminals. They never will be criminals. That's, it. they're professionals. Um, they're small business owners. And I think the same, we need to look at the same lens. Um, you know, black people, black communities are not, should not be criminalized. They're not criminals, but that's how the police treats them. And that has been um, really resonating within within the street vendor community, as diverse as it is, um, as you know, complicated as racial relationships are from one community to the next or one ethnicity to the next. Really understanding that the way that police target street vendors is often is is worse in for Black communities across the U.S. Mm. And we we had just before, in fact, right with the couple of instances in the subway stations, uh, which in fact got a lot of attention uh, uh, with where the street vendors were in fact uh, arrested and kind of brutalized in the process. Uh, Mohammed, anything to add to that? What Karina said about this, this specific issue and the larger issue about law and order, state and police? Well, I think Karina covered it very well. I'm just thinking about small businesses and enforcement Look at the NYPD. Have you ever watched or seen NYPD officer going into a restaurant and giving a ticket to a worker or a manager of a restaurant? That never happens, right? We've never seen that. But that what happens with food vendors in the streets for very minor violations. So getting the NYPD out of the community was very important. And there's one, and we'll have to share it, a number of questions. How does one get involved with the street vendor project? Which is, in fact, a terrific question. Uh, could you give a couple of examples, uh, Karina? Yeah, I think a couple of great ways to get involved beyond translation is also, you know, collaborating with us to do outreach. So we often do, you know, when we're, when we're outside and things are back to normal, um, we do a lot of in-person outreach to folks across the five boroughs. Um, and that's a mix of doing, of sharing with people um, some of our Know Your Rights handbooks, um, sharing with them, you know, more recent um, news uh, regarding street vending, or recent regulations that have been passed that would be relating to them and really just getting to know one another and then getting them involved in the organization. And that's a great way for folks to, to jump in and participate. Perfect. Uh, slightly changing the conversation here, uh, Fatima asks, so what is the significance of a letter grade to a street vendor? Does it matter or is it just cosmetic or a letter grade? <laughs> It's similar to a restaurant. So it's the okay. significance of um, when you see a restaurant with an A, that means they're all up to code. They've been inspected by the health department. You definitely want to eat there. Same with, same with street vendors. Um, and uh, Michael asks, what are some of the worries vendors have about reopening in terms of keeping themselves and the customer safe? You talked about it a bit. Do you have anything to add to that? I would just add a little bit, you know, a lot of folks who are vendors, they're, they're seniors um, uh, or they're the primary caretakers in their family. So they have kids that they're also looking out for. And so I think one of the main concerns is not just, you know, their own health and safety as things are still in flux um, in, terms of, in terms of the pandemic spreading or stopping. So for people, they're personally um, nervous about that. Uh, Julia asks, are food vendors able to get the federal stimulus packages as gig workers, or is there another worker description profession uh, that worked for them? We generally say informal economy, because gig workers, um, that often implies like Uber, for example, where there's a big corporation, but then there's all these independent contractors who should be considered um, employees, but they're considered independent contractors instead. Um, so they're technically gig workers in that sense. But for street vendors, there's not this big corporation that um, they're a part of as a small business owner. They're, they are, in fact, independent contractors and individual small businesses. 
so folks would not be eligible for gig worker um, benefits. It's it's often through um, through small business is really where how people would be be getting benefits or through the federal stimulus check. But again, that only if you have that your nine digit social security number will you social be eligible. security number is crucial for that, right? And then um, Ellis has it wants to volunteer. I'll, I'll keep her email and send it to you. She's at Baruch uh, CUNY. Uh, and then a question is: Are small street, uh, small scale street vendors such as churro vendors, who often operate without license, held to the same standards and regulations as food trucks? Are these vendors generally even uh, more vulnerable? Yeah, indeed. I mean, those vendors are the most vulnerable. And what these vendors do, they follow all the other health and safety rules and regulations within their tiny micro business. So here is what happens. And uh, maybe we need to explain again that most of these vendors have the food vendor license. License. Most of them. They do have the food vendor license for themselves, which means they did the two-day class with the Department of Health they know how to protect the food, how to serve the food. They usually uh, follow all the other rules. But of course, they are not going to have all the equipment like the food truck has on their smaller shopping carts. And of course, that all gets back to why there are uh, limits on the permits. Uh, a very good question. Um, uh, maybe Karina, what does the distribution by gender look like among vendors? Are there significant differences between women and men in the food industry, for example? Yeah, so um, in the fall of last year, we did a study where we interviewed 50 um, female street vendors to get a better understanding of, um, you know, what are some of their top concerns? Who are they? Um, what are, and what are their, their challenges? And for the most part, we saw that the, the majority of folks that we spoke to were unpermitted and often unlicensed. Um, and that folks, female vendors were more likely to work in the outer boroughs as well. Outer boroughs, and they're also in some ways not into what appears to be masculine networks, no? From my study of that uh, um, report of yours, they seem to be also excluded from where in some ways men are cornering the permits market, but the women are in fact kept more marginal, even more marginal. Um, so what kinds of things will, uh, this is, uh, by the way, the last, last question by, was by Giselle uh, and this one by Kate. What kinds of things will uh, make a police write a ticket to a vendor? Well, anything. I mean, I know that the police, and I talk to a lot of people who have a good relationship with the police to better understand how things are in my five years in work in Times Square. And I know that the police have in their book a page with like 50 things they can write to any street vendor, 50 possibilities. What I have off the top of my head, not having the license warrant. Any street vendor, they should have the license warrant and display to the customers. Uh, being 10 feet from the crosswalk, 20 feet from a building and a store entrance, which is by the way, impossible sometimes to follow in any given sidewalk in Manhattan. Uh, being 18 inches only to the curb, you can't be two feet away from the curb. It's only 18 inches. Uh, you can't be touching a lamppost, a fire hydrant, a foam booth. You can't be touching any structure. Uh, you can't have anything next to the cart or the table. Everything should be kept inside or under the cart, which is very complicated and also really poor rule written that you can't even keep stuff on the top of your cart. So if I keep a box of pretzel on the top of my car, that's a violation. And I have no idea why. It doesn't make any sense. But the list is very long. The list is very long like, and it's really, it's really silly. I remember a study that showed that the, uh, it's also unevenly uh, implemented. For instance, what you get a ticket for in Chinatown is not what you get a ticket for in the Union Square market, farmer's market, uh, which is, of course, factored through race and class. Uh, where, for instance, an example, the study showed that technically you're not supposed to sell any produce out of a box on the side of your cart, okay? But no one implements that rule. If you are in a farmer's market, upscale farmer's market like Union Square, 
but people will implement that rule if you're in Chinatown uh, or if you're elsewhere. So there's uneven implementation uh, based on, in fact, class and race, which is, of course, linked to partly the current concern about how the law is implemented with different kind of weight on different communities. Uh, one question. Um, so let's see. Uh, do vendors, do food vendors get fined for hiring undocumented or the sanctuary, uh, does the sanctuary policy protect them? Does it protect them from ICE? Well, so I know that a lot of food vendors uh, hire undocumented vendors and I was undocumented myself for the first maybe three or four years of my life uh, in this country and there was no issue, there was no uh, contact with ICE between uh, the ICE and the employer or the NYPD and the employer. So there was no such an issue. We all know that the vending community is very strong. They all look out for each other. Although they are so diverse, coming from very different backgrounds, but we never heard of any interaction between the vendors community themselves and ICE. Uh, just to add to that, that actually yeah. um, street vending is, is a profession that is almost easier for folks who are undocumented to get into um, because you don't need to have a social security number in order to get your license or your permit. Um, and so it's in this instance and with this profession that folks are the owners of their business, right? They're the ones who are managing their schedule, they're managing um, their money, their income and, and revenue. Um, and so that's, you know, often very different than there's, you know, if you're, if you're working for somebody else, there's often the chance of it being an exploitative relationship. So street vending is actually a great, a great mode of employment for folks who are undocumented. So, uh, kind of a further question, uh, which is about a bit about credit and banks. Uh, one of the question is, do you think it's hard for street vendors to get loans because it's hard for them to show earnings? Are most still cash only? And then a related question, or why haven't street vendors, uh, why do not street, let's put it like that, why do not street vendors accept credit cards? Yeah, that's right. It's a mix of all of that. I mean, okay. it all starts with the immigration status. If you don't have social security number, no bank want to give you any credit or any loans. That's one. Two, the nature of the business, it's mostly cash. And it's mostly cash because of a number of reasons, but that's one of them. If I'm undocumented, if I don't have a bank, how would I accept credit cards? How would I have a square or a clover or a system where I accept e-payments and have this whole structure? So it's a lot into that, but of course, the nature of the business is also essential part of it. Um, and one of the follow-up question is, so now that the NYPD is out of the business of ticketing, finding food vendors, which is, we should say, parenthetic, we don't know yet. We will see how it plays out. Which agency is the one issuing fines or might be issuing fines? You talked about it. Could you repeat some of those agencies? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the right question would be which agencies are issuing tickets. Multiple. The agencies yeah. are so many. Department of Health is the main one who do all the inspections on food vendors. Department of Sanitation, Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of Fire, uh, for vendors who operate around parks, Department of Parks and Recreation, all these uh, agencies enforce the lower right tickets, but we still don't have a dedicated unit for the street vendors only. Mm. I mean, one of the question, and maybe I'll just answer this, is the city acting as a rent seeking landlord? In fact, uh, uh, it's not because it's in some ways it is not auctioning this. It is just looking at it as kind of a legal enforcement. Uh, let me see. Um, Okay, considering many street vendors aren't receiving uh, government assistance, do you, guys, do you guys know of any fundraisers, GoFundMes, et cetera, that we can contribute to and promote? Yes. <laughs> we actually, so we, um, one of the first things that we did once we learned that the city was closing down was start a GoFundMe um, for street vendors. And um, you can send along a link as well. We will but, send along a link to all the participants today, right? Yeah. yeah mm. But through, through this program, we've so far been able to support um, about 200 street vendors with $300 cash assistance cards. 
And one of the question uh, Alice asked, I think, I understand the street vendors are a remarkably diverse group. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the unique challenges that undocumented street vendors have and what organizing uh, SVP is doing to address those threats. I mean, you have, of course, already talked a bit. Maybe you can repeat them a bit, little. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, so we're actually, there's two separate areas that we're pushing for right now, um, just as an immediate response to um, undocumented folks being excluded from relief um, within COVID. Mm -hmm. And so one is that, you know, we're recognizing that the Open Society Foundations is only reaching 3%. And so as part of this push, or 3% of undocumented New Yorkers, so as part of this push to defund the police, right, of looking for different revenue streams to be able to support undocumented workers, we're really um, creating advocacy work with other coalitions that we're a part of to pressure both the city and the state to create relief funds for undocumented folks. Um, so we actually are partners um, pushing for a bill to pass at the state level called S8277, which would create actually a mark to market tax, meaning it would tax billionaires and redistribute the wealth to undocumented folks in New York state. Wow, that sounds like a radical anarchist measure, Karina. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a sign of the times that we have um, elected officials who are willing to, who are really listening to what their communities need and working to create legislation that addresses that. And a number of people want your contact information. We'll send them out uh, to the organization. Uh, here's something I've always wondered. How does a street vendor claim and then hold on to their spot? How do they prevent another vendor from taking their place? Are there uh, uh, vendor coalitions, unions of sorts, which help regulate this? Yeah, so the vending community, as we talked earlier, is very strong and very connected. And the neighborhoods uh, scale, but also in the city scale, there is always a respect code amongst the vendors that when someone works in some area or some corner for a number of years, nobody would ever go right next to them and sell the same thing. That's very, very rare. That doesn't happen. Unless in some blocks where a lot of vendors can work and actually sustain their business and make a living which is, of course, a case in some places in Midtown, in some places in Queens and Brooklyn. Sometimes you see one block with 10 halal food carts and everyone has a line. Everyone is busy. Everyone is making money. So there is really no competition within this issue. Everyone is working in their spot. They know where their cart should be. And that is something that we have seen in different areas also. Hey, Mama, the subset of questions about laws and rules uh, one of the question is, is it that it's the city council and, uh, and the various subcommittees make the rules and the police implement? Is that like police? And of course, there are, you're saying there are six different, at least six different agencies who implement that rules. The rules themselves, how are they made? Are they made in the city council and then in various subcommittees? Yeah, usually the rules and regulations are made by the city council, but then every agency will come up with their policy. So for example, the health department might come up with a specific policy or a specific explanation to assert the rule and then have the health department and inspectors go out and enforce those rules and uh, fine people. And we have seen that in many rules that we believe don't really make sense. And we have seen that the health department and inspectors sometimes, they won't care about anything but writing tickets. And that is something we are struggling with. But of course, it comes from their leadership more than the individual. And the same thing with the police. I think the conversation is very big, but I do remember a lot of people were talking about that officer who killed Eric Gardner in the street for selling cigarettes and uh, choke holding him on the sidewalk in a very brutal way that the whole globe was watching and the whole globe denied. And the people, the defender of this officer were just saying he was doing his job. So that's a big problem. If the whole system is allowing this to happen, if the commanders and people in charge are giving such instructions to the officers, there is a big problem with the whole leadership, with the whole system, but also the individuals. I mean, those people, those officers, they are human beings, right? They have a brain. They are not a machine that someone will press a button and just do whatever. If the rules don't make sense, if their leadership is giving them 
nonsense orders, they shouldn't just listen to it. And I'm talking about different scales here, not only this incident. Yeah, so I'm going to finish up. We're running out of time. I'm going to finish up with two more questions. And then maybe we'll open up to your kind of concluding thoughts, uh, Karina and, and Mohammed. So two questions are, how does the city attack street vendors? Does the city assume a certain income? How do they track business? Yeah, so every street vendor, as I said, whether they work in a bigger cart or truck or a smaller uh, version of business, they do have a sales tax ID and they report their sales tax every quarter, just like any other business. So they pay their sales tax every three months, every quarter. At the very end of the year, they report their whole income. So they file the taxes, their uh, income taxes, and they pay that. So that's how it works. Last question from Ellis. I hope I'm speaking, is saying his or her name correctly. It's Ellis de Graal, uh, which is, um, uh, I understand that there are specific regulations, but are there specific geographic limitations to permits that is limited to particular boroughs or can a vendor work in any borough neighborhood they want to? Yeah, that, that's a bit complex, but usually most of the permits are called citywide permits, which means they allow the vendor to work anywhere within the five boroughs. But of course, keeping in mind all the rules and regulations that will make many streets and many sidewalks restricted for vending. So there are a very small number of assigned borough specific permit permits. Uh, there are 50 for each borough. So there are 50 permits for Queens, Brooklyn and the Bronx and also Staten Island. Uh, these are the only specifics uh, on when it gets to the permits, but generally the permits are citywide. Excellent. So this is the time for in some ways, take a couple of minutes, maybe articulate uh, uh, in a way uh, your closing thoughts. And, and uh, thank you for kind of, this was really, I thought, I knew a lot about specifics of street vending. I've learned a lot today, uh, the specific and details about it. Karina, you want to go first? Any concluding thoughts? Sure. Um, just, you know, support your local street vendor. Think about who they are. Talk to them. Um, have a conversation. Get to know one another. Um, street vendors are a vital part of our communities across New York City. They're not just providing fresh food and produce to your to neighborhoods. They're providing, providing affordable food to neighborhoods. And they're also a huge part of creating local economies. And as residents of the neighborhoods that they're working in, they're also supporting to make sure that, that you know, revenue is circulated in your local economy. And this is a great part of what, um, what supports one another. Um, and I would also just say, trust that vendors are also part of what keeps New York City safe. Vendors know so much because they are constantly out in the streets um, watching out for their communities and they often know more about what's going on than anybody you'll run into um, because they are, they're the eyes on the street. And by the way, there have been a lot of good studies showing that in fact crime goes down where there are vendors um, and where there are people because wherever there are people there's less crime. Crime happens more often where in fact there are very few people. So a few people, especially women, are targeted in areas where there are a uh, lot less people and especially a lot less vendors, including, by the way, uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, the uh, examples in New York City, uh, where it was the street vendor in, uh, uh, in uh, what is that location where there was a, uh, a truck that was, which had an explosive in it, it was a street vendor that identified it uh, to the police. Okay, good. Mohammed, any last thoughts? Uh, yeah, I wanna echo what, what Karina said. Support your local vendor, support your small business, neighbor, your friend, your family member in the corner of the street. Uh, please donate. I can't emphasize enough how important donating is to our GoFundMe page support people who didn't receive a penny from the government, as Karina said, people who are struggling at the moment, that would be super helpful. And also talk to your friends, talk to the people you know about street vendors, tell them what's, what's out there, what's behind that person who is selling you uh, the product you love, the food you love and buy every day. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks, Karina. Thanks, Mohammed, for being patient with all my questions. And you have in fact answered 
all the audience questions. I've never been in a panel in which that has been done and we have did not ration or restrict any of the questions. So let me kind of give it back uh, to Mireya uh, and to Omar as saying, uh, thank you guys for uh, hosting us. Thank you for being here. I've learned a lot. Uh, we're so excited to have hosted this conversation. Um, mil gracias. And I really hope that folks follow us on um, the Latinx project page and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies page. We have another talk coming down the pipeline on food workers and uh, the food system. Omar? I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, applauses, virtual applauses uh, for everyone. Uh, thanks for such a great talk. Uh, we're really grateful for the work that you do. And uh, thanks for everyone who attended. So uh, keep an eye on, Thank you. on this series. Thanks so much for having us. And we will send the contact information. Uh, Omar, you can send it out to all the participants uh, from Marina. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care, Thank audience. You. Thank you for staying here. We started with almost 100 people and now we are at 46. All the best. Bye. Thank you.